everybody. We're here squinting in the sunlight at the Paris Air Show. I'm Joe Anselmo, Aviation Week's Editor-in-Chief, and joined today by two of the industry's sages, uh, John Schmidt from Accenture and Richard Abalafia from the Teal Group. And I should say in advance that you guys don't know each other, so if one says something, <laughs> the other doesn't necessarily endorse it. Um, guys, we have a lot of time on our hands because it doesn't seem like there's very much going on at this show so far. Am I, am I crazy? Yeah, I want to discuss local sports uh, scores or something. I mean, it, 321XLR, you know, for some reason I had it built up in my mind as a, a bigger bang than just the air lease orders, rumors of America and whatever else. It's an impressive plane, good start, but as a centerpiece of a major event like the Paris Air Show, maybe a little bit underwhelming. So you've got Space Jet too. And you've got Space Jet, Double Future Space Jet, uh, which of course is an MRJ-70, remanufactured as the M100, or renowned as the... I, yeah, I, I see what they're doing. It's interesting. We're talking the regional market here. You know, there are only two players in a $6 billion top line. How much interest is there really? Uh, it's a slow show, period. John, slow show for you? Well, for us it hasn't been very slow, but it's because we're driving different things into the marketplace and the supply chain and pressures that we're still seeing in spite of you know, current rates are pushing a lot of our clients to be looking into new technologies, artificial intelligence. But the thing that I found interesting here is the focus on environmental and the, the push for a more environmental airfare. I mean, you saw the announcement that came out today from the chief technology officers of some of the largest companies in the aerospace and defense, and, and then you see the demonstrators, right? The small electric propulsion, and talking about hybrid propulsion, uh, fuels. So quite, quite interesting and how much of a focus this year that seems to have been. It seems like the industry is actually waking up to the environmental issue and that it could be really exposed if it doesn't uh, get out in front of it a little bit. Yeah, you know, that's right. It, it, it is a, a big issue at the show, and obviously this is the Swedish uh, girl, Greta, who's come out of high school, and she seems to be spreading a gospel that's got some traction, and you never know what becomes a demographic bow wave, so you've got to respond to that, because at the end of the day, there are only three responses. There's the market-based mechanism, uh, which doesn't really satisfy people, uh, even though it, it, it might work, it doesn't satisfy the demonstrators. You've got non-market-based demonstra non mechanisms like, well, rationing, that's not going to work. And then you got technology. So obviously that's the only way forward. You got to use science to make the case that we are getting better. And I, I think we've been doing that. If you look at what we've done with engines, what we've done with airframes over the last what, decade, decade and a half, the push for efficiency has a lot of uh, correlated benefits, right? One of them is the environment. The other one obviously is lower cost for the airlines and then ultimately lower cost for those guys flying. I, I talked about, you know, it's boring. That's boring because we put out a show daily and we just go nuts over orders at air shows, right? And there's not a lot of orders this year. But is that really surprising? I mean, is, is this not just a pause? There were so many taken and the industry's got to ramp up the supply chain. So is this really surprising? Yeah, it's not terribly surprising, but still, there are people who look at book-to-bill ratios and other factors as a metric of industry health. And it's important to defend against the perception that we're heading towards a slump. There's absolutely nothing preordained about a slump. The only thing is we are, you know, we have the benefit, the blessing, if you will, of 13,000 jets on backlog. We should uh, be grateful for that. We've got some ramp up, uh, uh, ramp up runway ahead on the single aisle front especially. Let's be grateful and not focus on the book to bill ratios because frankly they're going to be ugly. Yeah, I, I, mean, I look at the industry and I look over the longer haul and you look at what's driving commercial aerospace and the, the growth that's coming in aircraft in, in Asia, particularly in China. I don't think orders here at the show are really that big of an indicator person. I think I completely agree with Richard, even though we didn't rehearse that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We, the other thing we always write about is, is there a bubble year, year after year in the commercial aviation industry? Um, are, we, are we in danger of a slowdown? Do you guys see any signs of a slowdown? Well, you know, there's, 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 there's two markets here. Twin Isles, that peaked in 2015. We've been coasting at a plateau since. It's not the end of the world. There are some Twin Isle programs that could use a little care and feeding, uh, particularly 777X and A330neo, but it's hardly a crisis. Uh, with single aisles, I, I think if you go beyond rate 57 for Boeing and 63 for Airbus, you're in danger of creating a production capacity bubble. But in terms of orders, we've gotten used to the idea that the market wants what it wants to program in for the next decade, and everyone adjusts accordingly. Yeah, 
I would agree. I mean, I think you're seeing a lot of push today in increasing those rates to be able to satisfy orders sooner. We've got the backlogs, particularly in single aisle, that are going to sustain that. And, uh, and frankly, one of the things that keeps us active here at the show is, is talking to clients about how do you deal with those kinds of capacity requirements. And the research we do indicates that most executives feel like they're going to have a shortfall in production because they're not able to get technologies in place to help them through. So it opens up a lot of opportunities for digital, digital technologies, some of the artificial intelligence things that we work with. And, uh, and that's good business for us. Last question for you. You guys obviously are getting in the chalets, getting to the, the private rooms, talking with a lot of important people. What are people talking about here at the show this year? What's what, what's what's the topic of conversation? I can guess a couple. Of <laughs> well, of course, it's going to be heavily dominated by Max and NMA. So Boeing is the uh, very, very silent, uh, perhaps not entirely wanted uh, to be there, star of the show. Um, it's not exactly uh, clear that anyone knows what the max recertification date is. I think most of the markets, that is uh, FAA sometime late August, early September, EASA Transport Canada a month later, and then hopefully China end of the year, but really nobody knows. Uh, it's sort of all over the place. As, as for NMA, you know, there are people saying, this is the pivotal week. Um, I might be of that mindset too. They're gonna have to give us a compelling story about what they're doing for the business case and that there's still the likelihood of an ATO sometime in the coming months. I think the other thing we're I'm hearing a lot about is our mergers and acquisitions. And from you know, my perspective, we, we look at this all the time and the deal volume in terms of deals done and the overall value or average value of deals is about where it was last year, a little bit higher. Uh, but primarily, we've been seeing companies looking for technology or capability strategically to be able to add into the portfolio versus bigger transactions. Right before the show, obviously, we had the Raytheon UTC proposed merger. Did either of you guys see that coming? Because I, I sure did. Uh, no, I didn't see that coming, although once listening to the investor call, I mean, the, the logic of it I, you know, makes sense, uh, but certainly didn't project that. Yeah, I certainly didn't. If you had been asked to pull new, two names out of a hat for a likely merger, I, I wouldn't have bought so that, That's what happens when you pull two names out of a hat. It's interesting how the an analysis community is kind of divided. And it's not just over issues of valuation. It's whether or not execution is going to be such a big challenge that their arguments, which do appear to be strong, uh, might just be overtaken by this execution concern issue. Uh, I, I tend to be an optimist about this. I, I, I see the argument it's just it's a long road ahead. Yeah, I, I think they're going to be able to overcome the execution issues on this. I mean, UTC has some experience in doing these things. And I think we're going to see that this one come together. Okay, well, we'll see you guys next year at the Raytheon Technology Show, right? <laughs> if, if, all, if that all comes to fruition. Uh, Richard, uh, John, thanks so much for stopping by. Thanks, Thank Joe. You.